Okay, everyone, we're taking a look at our third set of questions from the AP Statistics final. This one is question number 21. And we have the computer output shown gives the least squares regression line for calories and proteins in grams. Let's back this up a little bit so you can see it. Oh, maybe a little bit too much. We have the typical computer output here, predictor, constant calories, coefficient, standard error of the coefficient, t and p, which again, we've never really used those and we're, we're not about to. Down over here we have s, the standard deviation of the residuals, r squared, that is the square of the co correlation coefficient, so uh, literally r squared, and this one over here, r squared adjusted, is something that we're never going to use, so you have to kind of train yourself not to use that. And so the question is, which of the following statements is a correct interpretation of the slope of the regression line? Okay, so let's find the slope of the regression line. It's right over here. If we, it's the second line. Calories is the name of our explanatory variable. And the slope is 0 0.06. Okay, so that should be everything we need to know. If calories is explanatory variable, that would mean that protein is going to be our response variable. And then down over here, just to remind us about things, we have the sentence frame for the slope of a regression line. So for every increase of one unit in the explanatory variable, the response variable increases by about whatever B1 is, which is the slope units. So if we were to replace this for every increase of one unit, well, the unit here is calories. So every one calorie in the, well, I guess calorie content, The response variable, now the response variable here is going to be the predicted, the uh, protein. Uh, and I'm saying in grams here, and I'm looking and I'm seeing predicted protein in all of the answer choices, or most of the answer choices. So we're going to change this to predicted protein. Now the slope here is positive, positive 0.06. So we get an increase, and the slope value is 0 0.62, and the unit is grams. So taking a look at what we have written based on our sentence frame, I think the best one over here should be this letter B, which reads almost exactly the same way. For every one unit increase in calorie content, the predicted protein content increases by 0 0.63 grams. Moving on to question 22. The least squares regression line is fit to a set of data. Now, if one of the data points has a positive residual, then... Now, for this one, we're going to have to figure out exactly what they're saying here. Um, if the residual is positive, that means that actual minus predicted is greater than zero which solves out into the actual is greater than the predicted. So that would mean that the point, um, the actual point, is going to be above the regression line. So taking a look at our answer choices now, we've got the correlation between the values of the ex response and explanatory must be positive. Well, that's not exactly true because there should be some points with positive and some with negative residuals. So I don't like letter A. Remember that if you add all the residuals together, you're going to get a value of zero. So for any regression line, there's got to be some positive and some negative residuals. Letter B, we have the point must lie above the regression line. That one sounds pretty good. Letter C, the point must uh, lie near the right edge of the scatter plot. And there's nothing here that actually tells us where this point is right or left in the scatter plot. The point is probably an influential point, and again, 
There's nothing up to tell us whether or not we are an outlier in the x direction on the far right or the far left. So we probably couldn't tell based on that the clue whether or not it's an influential point. And of course, all of the above are not true because we have marked a few of these wrong, which means the point must lie above the regression line should be the correct answer. Moving on now to question 23. This is nice because we've already talked about a lot of these points. Which of the following statements concerning residuals is true? So we already talked about the sum of the residuals is always zero. So this is a true one right over here. Letter B says, a plot of the residuals is useful in assessing the fit of a least squares regression line. And of course, that is true. Um, that's why we do uh, residual plots is to assess whether or not our regression line is a good fit for the data. So there's already two correct answers as far as I can see. So the E should be correct. Let's take a look at C and maybe talk about it a little bit also. The value of a residual is the observed minus the value of the response one would predict. So that's the actual minus prediction. We talked about that in number 22. And an influential point in the scatter plot is not necessarily a point with the largest residual. That is correct as well. So all of these are actually true. And just to talk a little bit more about letter D, because I think I didn't talk about that enough, um, the influential point is actually going to pull the regression line close to it. So if the influential point is close to the regression line, that's actually going to mean it's going to have a relatively small residual in comparison to some of the other points uh, under that regression line. Right, so that residual is not going to be the largest because kind of by definition of influential point. Influential point will bring the regression line close to it. Let's take a look at 24 here. One characteristic of roller coasters that contributes to the maximum speed of the ride is the track's maximum height. Shown below show below hmm. shown below is a computer output for the regression of maximum speed on maximum height of nine roller coasters that recently opened around the world so again taking a look at this we can already cross out a few of these that we're not going to use now i should probably also mention that t and p these last two columns over here they are going to be used eventually, uh, but not really until second semester. So T and P over here, specifically these two values, those will have use for us in second semester. So question here is to talk about what about this S equals 10? Well, that is the standard deviation of the residuals. So if we think about what that means, a residual is the distance from a point to its predicted value. And so a point is typically 10 point, or a prediction is typically about 10.5 units away from the actual value. So this, let's re we'll read through all of these. This represents a standard deviation of the observed values Nope. This represents the standard deviation of the predicted values. Nope. This represents the standard deviation of the observed values of the explanatory variable height. No. This represents the average of the products of each standardized value for height and the corresponding standardized value for speed. Now that's not correct, but that's an interesting one because um, you might remember this as the way that we actually get the value of r squared or r is to uh, multiply the standardized value for the um, explanatory and response variable and then add them all together. Uh, so this has something to do actually with the value for R. And of course, the very last one, letter E here, this sounds really good. This is the standard deviation of the residuals. 
Moving on to question 25, we have a researcher wishes to study how the average weight of children changes during the first year of life. He plots these average versus age in order oh, and decides to fit a least squares regression line to the data with x as the explanatory variable and y as a response variable. Calculates the following quantities. We have here r, x bar, y bar, s, a, s, y, and s, x. So this question is, what is the y-intercept of the least squares regression line? In order to calculate this, we'll need a couple of equations. The first one is, how do we find the slope of the regression line? Uh, we need the slope, otherwise we cannot get the y-intercept. So the slope is r sy over sx. And of course, they give us all of these values. So we'll just substitute those in. This gives us a slope of 0 0.3. Let's move this over here. And we're going to need another value. Now that we have our slope of 0 0.3, we're going to take our regression line here, uh, y hat equals a plus bx, substitute for b, and then we're going to remember that any regression line is always going to go through the point x bar comma y bar. Now we just have to substitute in those values. And then solve. And there we have it. Our y-intercept of the regression line is 4.65. Taking a look now at number 26, we've got um, Mrs. De La Fay, a sports writer, wants to know how strongly Orlando residents support the professional baseball team, the Orlando Rays. She stands outside the stadium before a game and interviews the first 20 people who enter the stadium. Now, uh, if you know you remember from what we did, it sounds really like a bad idea. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, she's not doing any randomization because she's only interviewing the first 20 people. And she's also standing outside the stadium, presumably... Uh, at the stadium where the Orlando Rays are playing. So she's going to get people who are probably more enthusiastic about the Orlando Rays than normal. So this, this sample for this survey, um, sorry, the sample for this survey, and this question just took a left turn on me because now they're asking what is the sample, so not what's wrong with this sample, although there are plenty that's wrong with it. But we're supposed to... Uh, the sample is going to be these these first 20 people. So the 20 people who gave the sports writer their opinion, these are going to be the sample, even though you know they are going to have a very strongly biased opinion. Their, their opinion is going to be, um, on average, their opinion is going to be different than the normal um, Orlando resident. So that, that takes care of this question. Um, number 27, a simple random sample is, and let's remember our definition of a simple random sample. So in a simple random sample, every possible subset of n from the population has the same probability of selection. It's not about the individual, it's about the subset of individuals. Every subset, every smaller group of n individuals has the same probability. So let's see if that helps us here. Uh, any simple, any sample selected by chance? No, that is not a simple random sample. The chance is important, but just having a, a random device doesn't make it a simple random sample. Any sample that gives each individual the same chance of being selected? No, that's that's not correct. That's exactly what I was talking about. This one over here, uh, it's not about the individual, it's about the group. So that's incorrect. A sample that gives every possible sample of the same size 
the same chance of being selected. Now that sounds correct, but we're gonna look at the rest of these. Letter D says, a sample that selects equal numbers of individuals from each stratum. So now the fact that we're talking about stratum here makes me think that this is probably not correct. Uh, and letter E, a sample that contains the same percent of each subgroup of the population. So that is a very fancy sampling method, a lot like letter D actually. Uh, but that's not a simple random sample. Simple random sample doesn't actually make any distinctions for any subgroups or any stratum, strata. So that's not correct at all. So that looks like the correct answer in this case is letter C. 28 says that a stratified uh, random sample is appropriate when, and uh, let's think about what that means. What is a stratified random sample? In a simple stratified random sample, the population is divided into strata, which are subgroups that are similar in terms of one or more confounding variables. So in our Justin Timberlake example, the subgroups were similar because they were in the same row, and the row that they were in was a confounding variable. Each strata is then going to undergo an SRS, and the combined individuals will then comprise our sample. So let's see if any of these are um, give an idea about the appropriateness of a stratified random sample. So do we use a stratified random sample when it's impractical to take a simple random sample because the population is too large? Well, that tends to happen, but that's not the reason why we're taking a stratified random sample. Strat we take a stratified random sample because we know that a confounding variable exists and we don't want to control for that variable. Letter B, the population can be easily subdivided into groups according to some categorical variable. I don't like that, the categorical variable. It's and the variable you are measuring is quite different within the groups, but very similar between groups. So there's a couple of things that I don't like about this one. Um, subdividing the groups uh, is not the reason why you take a stratified random sample. Again, you take a stratified random sample because you know that there is a common uh, confounding variable in that subgroup. So letter C, the population can be easily subdivided into groups according to some categorical variable. There they go with that categorical variable again. I think maybe a lot of people make that mistake. And the variable you are measuring is very similar within the groups, that's true, but quite different between the groups. Okay, that, that, that little bit here, the ending about the variable being similar within the groups but different between the groups, that's true. But it's not because of a categorical variable, it's because of a confounding variable. So maybe it's the letter C that's uh, con making these two concepts conflated. Um, you intend to take a sample of more than 100 individuals. Nope, size got nothing to do with it. And they gave us the best answer at the end here. You're worried about under coverage of certain groups. Now I'm taking a look at the answer key, and the answer key is telling us that the correct answer is this letter C. And I don't know exactly how I feel about that answer key. Um, certainly, um, we, we already said that the second part of this is correct. The variable we're measuring is very similar within the groups, but different within the other groups. But I don't really know about this categorical variable part, but I guess based on this part right here, this part is kind of correct. So, and I guess the reading over here with the under coverage of certain groups, I think they're taking that a little bit too literally, uh, or they're taking that very literally. So I'm not, again, I'm not sure about this whole categorical variable business, but 
uh, we'll just have to go with it. The correct answer here is supposed to be letter C, and the second part of this is going to validate the entire thing. Uh, again, I, I don't know how, I don't particularly like this one, but I think we're going to have to just keep it in here for now. Uh, let's take a look at 29. A market research company wishes to find out whether the population of students at a university prefers brand A or brand B instant coffee. A random sample of students is selected, and each one is asked to try brand A first and then brand B, or vice versa, with the order determined at random. Then they indicate which brand they prefer. What is the response variable? So the thing that we're measuring here is the brand that they prefer. So that seems pretty clear that our correct answer here should be letter B. Uh, the thing that we're measuring, that which we're measuring is which one they prefer. So let's take a look at number 30, the last one here. Which of the following is not a major principle of good design for all experience? They might as well have just called this the principles of experimental design. I think that's what they're going for. So let's see, principles of um, design, uh, comparison to a control, yes, that is one of them. Replication, that is one. Now blocking is not a, a principle of design. Every experiment does not need to use blocking. And of course, randomization is, the, um, is a principle of design. So just a reminder, our principles of design here are going to be comparison, control, randomization, and replication. So comparison means that we're going to create multiple groups and so we can compare the effects of our treatment between different groups. Uh, control means that we are going to, uh, we're going to include or exclude based on Sorry, include or exclude experimental units based on uh, confounding variables. Randomization, so if we cannot control something based on uh, the control variables, or sorry, if we cannot control a confounding variable, then we're going to randomize, and hopefully these confounding variables will equalize within each treatment group. And lastly, replication, we want to have numerous, a large number of experimental units so that any of those effects from confounding variables will tend to um, average out, quote unquote. So those are our four principles of experimental design. And that was our uh, third video here on our AP Statistics Semester A final. We'll see you for the next one.